So thank you. Thank you guys for showing up Wednesday night. Like I said, feel free to network in the chat. Uh, my name is Andrea Garcia. I've been in multifamily for uh, about five plus years now. And I have got a Vishkar on the line with me as well and Drew. And we're going to show you guys tonight a little bit more about what's involved in the team structure and how to coordinate your third party teams whenever you are building a team of your own and how to manage those vendors. Today's agenda, we're going to start off with multifamily freedom chaser community, description of what the community involves. Number two would be an introduction in general. And number three is the main topic, which is the syndication third party teams. And then afterwards, we're going to have a little bit more time for Q&A. I'm actually pretty happy to, let me go back to this slide. I'm happy to see Lane on here, Edward, Leonard. Oh, Anna, I haven't seen you in a while. Oh, nice to see you guys. Carmen, Ava, Sandra. Well, thanks. thank you guys so much for showing up and just being supportive in the community and getting a little bit more information about what it involves to invest. And that's part of what this slide is, is about, is what it means to be a multifamily freedom chaser in this community. Some people are able to absorb and pay for thousands of dollars worth of classes. And then they decide, no, thanks, I'm good. Thanks for the free education, or sometimes it's not even free. I mean, people pay hundreds of thousands for this education, sometimes decide just to not take action. So that is one part of the investor. There's another investor that we see that's a passive investor, and that's somebody who learns a little bit more about multifamily real estate. However, they realize that becoming an operator, like an actual active operator, is a lot more work than they thought. So they would rather like to be a more passive investor and let others do the work. But what, what's great about this is that they had learned knowledge about how to underwrite and vet operators. There's also the part of being an active operator, that's us, and those people love multifamily real estate. They now know what it takes in order to build a team and to operate a property and a business, and they're ready to further their education. This next slide is discussing a little bit more about multifamily preferred partners program. I was actually gonna share the uh, Google sheets on this one, but just a quick synopsis of what it is. It's essentially you get multifamily freedom chaser discounts and just go to the website or book a call with Trevor, but you'll get a little bit more in-depth multifamily education, elite level underwriting, uh, asset management training, you name it. I'm just gonna have to see if the video plays. Multifamily Freedom Chasers family, I have exciting news for you all. We are launching our preferred partners program for the community. You as a community member, as a Freedom Chaser, have access to this right now for free. So what is the preferred partners program? It is a program designed when you are ready to accelerate your multifamily real estate journey. You are ready to invest in yourself, to level up your education, and business building experience. This is the place to go. These are the partners and resources that we have invested into and we use hands-on that have helped us level up in our multifamily journey. Right. So pretty cool. Our preferred partners that are part of this list, it, it continues to grow, but right now they have over $2 billion of assets under management. Super cool. High level teams and high level operating individuals. So let me walk you through this here really quickly. We have Gabe Bowling's real estate training, Mastering Multifamily with Vina Jetty with her educational vault, Rockstar Capital and Robert Martinez, they have several different educational options. If you need mindset and performance coaching, we got Keston Glasgow with Purpose Ways. The Mary Machine website, funnels, marketing, everything you need there. Self-directed retirement, uh, services with Horizon Trust, CRM, an underwriting multifamily course with Ken Gee himself. And then if you don't have the funding, but you're ready to accelerate your multifamily journey and invest in yourself and invest in your business, we have DC Global Enterprises where you can get no interest funding to fund those type of investments. So take advantage of the preferred partners program of the multifamily freedom chasers, and let's continue our chase for freedom together. Nice. Well, that list was actually updated a while back. So you guys can click on the link or look at multifamily free, at, look at freedom chasers, capital.com slash partners. You can be able to see what other great discounts are available. 
I think they also just updated it with um, the Michael Blanc underwriter as well and a few other courses. Okay, let me know if you guys can still see my screen. Yeah, uh, you can switch back to uh, sharing mode. We're, we're, uh, yeah. Let's see here. We're to, How about now? Uh, using, yeah, we're using or we're reviewing the uh, controller view. Uh, switch gotcha. to the um, the other one. How about now? Still seeing the controller view. Oh, okay. Let's see here. You might have to in Zoom uh, switch, uh, select your other monitor if you're using two. Yeah, that might have to be the case. All right. Thanks, guys. I'm still getting a whole hang of the Zoom situation. We've got the knowledge, just the Zoom classes we definitely need to take. <laughs> I'm just speaking from my end. All right, let's see here. How about now? Same as before. Oh, same as before. Okay. I feel like Drew, if Want could you share? Present? Yeah, let me have you you share your screen. I think it was, it's a little tricky sometimes. I know it always plays around with me. Sometimes it works when you do on the Google Sheets and the PowerPoint. It, Thank uh... God we have Drew. <laughs> Thank God for Drew. We're gonna blame guys. Drew you guys need a Drew on your team. Yeah, you definitely do. See you, okay. He's definitely the integrator, and I'm a little bit more of a, a visionary integrator hybrid. Um, but yeah, we want to ask you enough, so. <laughs> <laughs> you want to ask you guys, tell us about who you are. I mean, the main purpose of these Zooms is to network with one another in the chat and also get to know each other, but feel free to raise your hands just to describe a little bit more about who you are, if you're new in multifamily or you have years of experience, and if you are looking for people on your general partnership team you're looking for capital so go ahead and um raise your hands let me actually switch to we are always looking for you know partners as well so we would love to know where you are in your journey and um, understand how we can help you so please don't feel shy make sure you raise your hands make sure you're visible so that not only us if there's somebody else who finds you know um, jibes with you better than they can partner with you. That's how this happens. That's how you find new people. And that's how you partner with people. So do tell us where you guys are from. Last time we hosted, uh, we had a, uh, uh, we were able to kind of match make. We had a, uh, someone call in who was in San Antonio and then uh, another couple who were in San Antonio and hopefully they they ended up working together. Uh, looks yeah. like we got Leonard. Leonard, I'm going to um, go ahead and uh, let us know who, about yourself. All right. Hi, I'm Leonard, and I've been doing um, the multifamily since March, end of March, beginning of April of this year. So right now, um, my marketplace is in the Atlanta area, so um, Atlanta, Georgia, but also just kind of the surrounding states in the south, southeast, um, and then I like Texas. I haven't looked at anything out in Texas yet, but Texas is just a place that I particularly, I mean, I particularly like. So if I'm, I feel like if I would go visit there and want to just go there to hang out, then that's probably a good place to, <laughs> to look. Cause at least then I'll have an excuse. Um, and um, I've been just going through doing underwriting, um, trying to build up broker relationships. And also um, I've been working on setting up, my um like multi my uh internet presence trying to get that together um i have not submitted any letters of intent just yet but um i should be able to find something sometime within the next you know sometime soon hopefully <laughs> but anyway um i you know if anybody wants to look at anything or need some boots on the ground in Atlanta or in the Southeast, let me know. I'll try to go and take a look at things. So yeah, there we go. Thanks everybody. Leonard, Good, amazing, man, amazing. Love it. Yeah. Right. That takes so much courage to just raise your hand and put yourself out there. Believe me, some people are 
very introverted. They don't turn on their cameras. They just want to listen in on the action. But you are taking a huge step just by saying hi to people, let people know your name. And it right. took it takes a while to get there. So thanks yeah. for that. All right. Thank you. Thanks for hosting these. <laughs> Anyone else want to give us like a one minute preview of who you are? I always say Dana came on. Hey, Dana. Hey, what's going on, Andrea? Um, <laughs> yeah. Hey, um, my name is Dana Jones. I'm a little late because I just got off of doing like a Zoom just now too, pretty much. So that was a good thing. It was also somebody that I think you might notice in the multi-family space, but uh, my name is Dana Jones. I live out here in Los Angeles, California. I actually do the multi-family lending and I also do it for, um, so I do it for multi-family and also other commercial assets such as like hotels and things of that nature. Um, my partner, Erica, she does the residential lending so she does like the DSCR loans, the fix and flips and all that good stuff. So besides from just doing the lending, I also invest in real estate as well, too. So I have a single family rental portfolio in Baltimore, Maryland. I have a couple of single families out here in Los Angeles, California. And now um, after I met like a rock star such as Andre is like I'm getting myself into the multifamily space. So it's like I'm starting to, you know trying to go ahead and do a fund of funds so I can actually build my multifamily portfolio up. So do the fund of funds first. So therefore right there, I can actually you know, know everything from like A to Z. And then I can, that way I can actually formulate my team and start doing it like my own GPM as well too. That is amazing, dude. And I will say as a capital raiser myself for my team, I can say that uh, fund of funds is gaining a lot of traction and a lot of popularity. I mean, that's a, uh, talk of the town now and so people who are interested in raising capital i actually motivate them to go ahead and look at it, explore fund of funds because that's a very powerful model of bringing capital to a deal and actually partnering up with people high quality um you know syndicators high quality operators without taking on the headache of actually operating the asset perfect uh, thank you i appreciate that yeah. all right we have enoch joy let's invite him Hey, so my story is I came to US about nine months back. I'm a student and I figured I'm going to do a business here. So I started looking at real estate, figured out I can buy a single family house near my college, rent it out to college students. So I got in an investor. I'm under contract for a single family house. And I was speaking with someone and they mentioned that, hey, this is pretty much what a syndication is. You pull in money from investors, you go buy a property. And then I started researching about multifamily and here I am. So that's my story in a nutshell. Trying to learn more. Amazing, man. You're in the right rooms, dude. Yep. Thank you for that. That's really impressive, by the way. But I mean, yeah. how old are you? I am 32. Wow. I mean, still, you're eons above many people people who still haven't taken action mm -hmm. so that's great that you're in this room and learning yep. yeah yeah hey thanks Thank so much yeah all right let's get this uh show on the road andrea yes drew can you do a screen share love it let's go all right so i want to describe to you a little bit more about who we are but first let's do a disclaimer we are not attorneys financial advisors, tax advisors. The purpose of the series is for informational purposes only. And before you make any investment decision, you should definitely consult with your own financial advisor or personnel. So uh, yes, definitely speak with a professional about any future financial investment advice. This is mostly for education. Great, third party teams. So we want to describe to you a little bit more in this series about what these third-party teams are and your support teams for multifamily. Before diving into any deal, you guys definitely have to have these, I would say, third-party vendors available to you, or at least understand their costs when it comes to working with them so that you can be able to assess that in your underwriting. Now for the support teams in multifamily, I think Avishkar is going to describe a little bit more about who they are. Yeah, so, you know, the support teams actually are these external people that we need to rely on, even though in our team, we are the four core people. Um, 
three of which are on the call today. But you know, we we rely on other experts in their specific fields, and we've sort of divided this into you know three different sections: the deal team sort of that's looking at the acquisition part of it and helping us with that. Then there's the property team, like once we have a property and a contract, how they help us. And then there's the money team that helps us with the finances of the deal, right? So so we'll dive into this into you know further detail as we go go for into these slides further, but keep these broad uh, you know, definitions or broad uh, categories in mind that, you know, we're going to be looking at who constitutes a deal team, who constitutes the property team and who constitutes the money team. And in the end, we'll tie it in together with how we interact with the, these teams and how we work with these teams. So let's move on and move to the next slide. All right. So the deal team is basically, like I mentioned, the third party vendors that help us acquire and close a deal. So these would be the brokers, right? First, first and foremost, somebody has to reach out to these brokers. Most of the assets that we try to look at and acquire are actually on market assets. They have, they are with brokers. Sometimes they have their pocket listings and they may not necessarily be on market, but we have to reach out to commercial brokers, right? When we're in a when we're in the acquisition phase of a property, we have to get a lot of data up front for us to run the numbers the right way. My underwriter cannot run the numbers until and unless I have the actual data that I need to make sure that the asset is going to cash flow. Right, so uh, you need an insurance broker because you need to know what the insurance looks like. What are the sometimes there might be some some issues with the property, and then the you know you don't you don't realize that, but the insurance broker who has the expertise in that can look at it and and basically point out, okay, this is you can expect the insurance to be X, Y, and Z for this property, and this is the right vendor, this is the right insurance vendor for this property because they also work with multiple insurance vendors. So it's not like you go to uh, you know one particular company and that's the end of it they actually vet uh, multiple insurance uh, uh, insurance agencies to see which is the right product for you you need a transaction attorney of just like any real estate you know you need uh, any real estate closing you need somebody who can do help you with the closing and of course they work with paralegals these are all security, so you do need an SEC attorney for syndications. You need, of course, a title company that will help you close. You need a tax consultant or a tax advisor. We have a tax strategist that we will probably be bringing on um, as one of our experts. Uh, and then you need uh, other people who can bring in other investor leads. Let's move on to the next slide. You want to take on Andrea from here? You're, you're on mute. Yes, yeah, so the property team, they'll help you investigate costs and operate the deal. So before we jump into any deal, we have to see who these people are. And actually, I'm in charge of obtaining quotes from all these different third parties, from inspectors who can come and look at the property on our behalf. So it, it's usually our asset manager and the inspector who could either be a general contractor, a development director, or somebody who you know has experience at the property level to be able to assess these deals the property and maintenance managers that are on site, you have to work with them to be able to investigate these deals. And some there's a little caveat to this too. If you're able to make sure that if you're going to go buy a property, you don't want to scare the property and maintenance managers. It's best if you just say, hey, we're on site. We want to refinance this property because nobody wants to lose their job to somebody they don't know, right? So just be kind of incognito and just say you're there for a refinance. Also, uh, there's people who are appraisers that you're going to need to be able to vet and see what may be an example of a report that they've done, property condition report assessors, the PCNAs or PCAs, phase one environmental report assessors, and the property condition report and phase one assessors usually can come from one company. I've worked with people like Partner in the past, and they're able to do all these other reports like seismic, LBP, um, asbestos, radon, mold. Uh, so, and then there's also a surveyor that you're going to be able to work with who can provide you uh, with an updated survey. So sometimes a lender requires a survey that's occurred within the last six years or ten within the last five to 10 years. So you might need that and a zoning report, cost segregation specialist and asset managers who can help you go out to the property. If they're not already on your GP team, you need somebody who can help you either investigate the costs of what it's going to take to be able to optimize rent or reduce expenses. Let's move on to the next one. Also the money team. 
So the money team is essentially people who are going to help you finance and report on the deal. This can involve anybody from a mortgage broker to lenders, servicers, and even your limited partners, which could include fund to funds managers, private investors, as well as your accountant and CPA who's going to help you report and provide K-1 statements to your limited partners. You're going to need somebody that down the line, a 1031 specialist, if not already, but uh, for the people you need for sure are your limited partners and your lenders and your accountant. Those are the people you need for sure. Sometimes you don't need a mortgage broker, but it usually helps to work with a mortgage broker. We have one mortgage broker who's on the preferred partners list as well. And they're, they're able to shop around for you for a really good rate for any type of a loan you're looking to incur. And the type of debt is very important for you to understand what type of debt is going to go on the property, whether it's short term or long term. Uh, one thing I would want to point out here is, guys, that um, for people who want to be limited partners or want to start a fund of funds, I have actually created a free due diligence course. It's a mini series on how to do due diligence when you're kind of partnering up with other operators, when you're bringing capital to their deals how you can do due diligence on the operator or on the deal that comes to you. So I'm going to put that link in the in the chat and uh, please feel free to check it out. Again, it's free. I don't get anything out of it. Um, it's just basically to develop uh, a rapport with you and to get to know you better. So here's the link. Please feel free to check it out. Let's move on. All right, so this is our team, guys. So you know, I am uh, the primarily, primarily my role is raising capital, investor relations, and also my role is to lead the team in the vision that we have. I'm a visionary; that's how I work, um, and so that's that's my role. But you know, I I understand other aspects of it. For example, underwriting. I understand a little bit of asset management, and of course, broker outreach. But I cannot be doing everything myself, right? I need a team. So I work with, you know, I have, because I'm leading the team and because I am also in charge of my investors and they're the capital that I bring to the deal, I actually have my foot in all the different aspects. Like I have to be uh, talking to the deal team. I have to be talking to the property team. I have to be talking to the money team, of course, because at the end of the day, I have the investor's money that's invested with me. And I got to make sure that I'm the best um, sort of, uh, you know, I'm, I have their best interest at heart when I'm dealing with it. So I will be talking to uh, my other team members. Now, I may not necessarily directly interact with the, the other third party vendors. I will probably interact with my other team members because, you know, they have their rapport with these other experts when they're doing their, you know, their interactions, their due diligence. So, but I will actually be interacting with my team members to get those reports from them to make sure that my investors' interests are actually, uh, you know, safeguarded the best they can be. And so that's how we work. So then we come to the uh, the head underwriter uh, for us is Andrea. She has to work with, again with the deal team, right? She's in charge of her. She does the heavy lifting and when we're doing the acquisition. She has to do the underwriting. She has to get the accurate numbers for the underwriting because that's how we know whether the property is going to cash flow, whether, whether we're going to make money or we're going to lose money. So she needs the accurate numbers, right? Even after that, the underwriting process, a lot of people think that it stops after you've acquired the property and that's the end of it. Actually, that it doesn't end there because when you are, it's a, it's a live process that continues on. As you progress, you got to see where your property is headed. And part of that is also asset management because uh, for that, Andrea and Drew would work together and closely with these other, other, uh, other uh, third-party members to get those details so that they can piece the you know the puzzle together get those numbers into something that makes sense something some data that we can kind of uh, look at and understand where the property is headed so then we have uh, drew he's the head of operations and management again he's going to be primarily heavily talking to um uh, the, the 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 property team like the property managers to make sure that the property is functioning properly to make sure that we're not bleeding money when we have that asset that we've already acquired, right? We have Antoine who's local, so he is not only um, he's not only our our uh, you know head of broker relations, he's also a CPA. So he's going to be talking to our tax strategists, making sure that we are operating in a very tax efficient manner, right? He's local to that market, so he's going to make sure that say Drew sees some problem in the property, he's going to go there. And and check on it and talk to the property manager and say, say, hey, what's the problem? What are you doing? What's going on? So 
It's not that it's a very clearly defined role that one person has. We all interact with each other and with these third-party vendors. And on top of that, you see, for example, say, you know, a, a, a deal typically lasts for five to six years, five to seven years, right? Say somebody wants to go on a vacation, somebody has to pick up the slack. I mean, it doesn't mean that if you're running a syndication, you cannot go on a vacation. That's not the whole, that's the whole idea of this is so that we can earn passive income. And so that's where, you know, picking up the slack, somebody has to pick up that piece. And that's why we work as a team together and we interact with these third party vendors, making sure that all the pieces of the puzzle align and they form the complete picture. All right, next slide. Thanks, Avishkar. You can take on, Andrea. Awesome. Well, where to find these services? Uh, I've worked in this profession for over five years now as an underwriter, and we are constantly looking for either newer or more established individuals in these third-party vendor teams, as well as people who we trust to be able to provide feedback back and forth. So that of course comes with referrals. Make sure that you guys are out there networking, going to conferences, meetups, even in the chat, turning on your cameras, uh, being able to put in your information in the chat and even going to these live events. They're super helpful. Any meetup really can get you closer to having an intention of finding that type of person so that you can be able to talk to them, vet them a little bit and ask them, Hey, what are your, what do you charge for this type of a service when we do go under contract for these deals? So you want to make, make sure that you're aligning yourself with other high achievers, as well as people who are specialized in those services that we mentioned. There's also commercial listings. So the top brokers, you might usually see them on LoopNet, Crexy. They're constantly, um, I'm sending you emails to give you leads and say, hey, we have this opportunity available. What do you think? Give me your give me your feedback on this. And we want to be able to make sure that we respond within a timely manner to these vendors and to these uh, commercial brokers. There, you, we have to keep a great, great reputation with them so that they can keep feeding us leads as well. There's also the Preferred Partners Program. That list also includes options for the money team. And some other courses that you can be able to take as well that could be able to benefit you guys. And now it's time for some questions and answers for Q&A. You guys have any questions? Feel free to, you can actually uh, raise, raise your, your hand. hand, guys. Yep, let's mm -hmm. talk and uh, let's answer your questions. Yeah, I'd actually like to know if you guys have these people on your teams already. Like if you know have a list of these types of vendors for your own syndication team, or maybe just your own investment team. And, you know, how you're able to, if, if you have any recommendations as well, ask any questions. Let's see. I'll see if I find any questions in the chat as well. And if not, you guys can all go home early. <laughs> Let's see. I don't see any questions there. Did we answer all, all right, their going questions? Once. I mean, I we, think we were, we were reading a lot of different vendors job. here. Do you, do you guys feel like this is pretty achievable? Like you, you feel confident enough to go out and find all of them? Would it be helpful for you to have this as like a list? It's kind of like a checklist of all the, the folks you need to kind of gather to be able to operate. Okay, we have a question. What tool do you use for underwriting process? We are currently using Rob Beardsley's model um, to underwrite. Uh, you can get it at his, on his website, Lone Star Capital. It's a very comprehensive, very robust model. If you are going to be an underwriter on your team, I would highly recommend this book. If you haven't seen this book, oh wait, how do I show, well, show this? There you go. There we go. There we go. Are you guys able to see this book? I would highly recommend getting this book because this is going to help you underwrite, underwrite like a badass. You want me to put in the name of this book? Let me just let me just put in the link, Amazon link for this book. Let me just find that and put it, put that in for you guys. Um, it's a short book, it's, so it's not a very uh, very lengthy book for you to go through. And um, I have interacted with Rob Beardsley multiple times. We're in a mastermind together, so I know that he's he's really good at what he does, um, and uh, he's he's a badass at underwriting. So uh, let me just find this book. 
I also wanted to address Enoch's quite well, Enoch's not a question, but a comment. In the beginning, it does feel a bit overwhelming, especially if you're a beginner, to be able to find all these people to have on your team. But essentially you want to, you want to just have the relationships with them. And the team that you do establish for your own multifamily investing journey, that's your general partnership team. So these people, there's four of us in our team. Each one of us have our own relationships, have our own network. So I'm able to tap into the bit to the property team. I've worked with so many third-party assessors and vendors and appraisers that I can call them easily on their cell phones and say, Hey, I need a quote for this property within a three week turn. What do you give me? So I already have those relationships, but then there's people on our team like Avishkar and Drew who've brought other relationships into this team. And they've, we've just kept those alive and just keep talking with them so that in the future, when we do go under contract, that we're able to access them without question. Okay. Yeah. So like for my role is primarily raising capital for our deals. So we bring in money. Um, and so my job is to, especially I love talking to, you know, fund of funds managers because um, they can bring in capital. We can help them get, uh, get a piece of the pie, not, not necessarily as a GP split, but uh, from the fund of funds itself. Uh, I love talking to retail investors who come in. We do a five, we're only planning to do five or six C's, not five or six P's, uh, basically from uh, you know getting investing, helping accredited investors invest money. Um, so if you're one, feel free to reach out to me. If you're starting a fund of funds, feel free to reach out to me. I can guide you to certain resources that may be able to help you start one um, or so some books uh, to help you on your journey. Uh, Ronald and Mary Jane are asking uh, what order you should start assembling these third party members of your team. Where's a good place to start? I think it's it happens all at all in tandem. I don't think there's like one person that comes before the other because when you're in this, when you're in the operations and when you're when you're in the trenches, like you need everybody right there and then. So you gotta you gotta make sure you have uh, people you've already spoken to and talked to before you get a deal and a contract. So you've been able to actually delegate this too. You know, like um, yeah. I've, you know, with me and Vishkar, we've been able to as me as an underwriter, him as a capital raiser, we've been able to start these conversations, like you mentioned, with mortgage brokers, with going out to the actual market that we're investing in Columbus, Ohio. And we're able to actually speak to these mortgage brokers and lenders and see what they're lending on. What are their requirements? Have these conversations consistently. So definitely I would say the money piece would come first and then the deal team would come, I would say second, in my opinion, just because we do need uh, those commercial brokers to feed us the leads. So you, you have to have your acquisitions manager being in charge of having those great relationships so it could all be delegated depending on how many people you have on your team yeah and keep in mind guys that you know like in the money team you have the mortgage broker they'll be they'll be giving you those details on what the mortgage rates are like what what can you underwrite with i mean that's going to be super important so they you need to have those relationships with them um but it's not only about just picking up the phone and talking to them, also maintaining those relationships, making sure that you're in touch with them. If you have a property, send it over to them. They're happy to look at it just to let them know that you're serious about the deal and you're, you know, you're serious about being in this industry because there are a lot of dabblers, um, you know, and they want to make sure their, their time is not wasted. And I think more important than just getting a list of people is ha having those deep relationships with those people because that's how they will help you uh, grow your uh, your portfolio or grow your wealth uh, in however you're choosing to do. Yes, Lorena, did you have a question as well? Hold on, let me oh, ask her. Don't you? Yep, Here's she's Danny. unmuted. Yes, hi. Oh. Okay, great. Hi, um, I'm Lorena. I am currently in, my market is in the Sacramento, California area. Um, not particularly, I think it's just, you know, where I have my own boots on the ground. So I'm here and I kind of know, you know, the areas. But um, my question is, is like how, of course you could find somebody that knows how to do the job, that knows how to underwrite, that knows how to raise capital. But really like, how do you know that they're compatible, you know, with like, they're ethnics per se. Like how, how do you know that you can trust them just because they do the job well? 
So that's kind of a question. And I have to get that in, um, you know, your own personal endeavors. I would I would encourage you to check out my course because I answer that question on how do you, how to do a due diligence on other operators as well. So that certainly a, a, a you know um, a will apply to what you're what you're asking. But in a nutshell, um, I think it's about uh, it's about forming again those deep relationships, making sure that you spend enough time with that other person. You go into that dating phase and you don't go and marry the person the first day you see them. So you date the person for a while, understand what your cadence is. Now, it's not only about ethics. It's also about the fact that somebody may be very ethical, but their personality may not align with your personality, right? They may not be the right fit for you as, as a partner. So hey, there's a lot more to it than just the ethics. And I would, I'm not trying to undermine or downplay the ethics part of it. I think that's paramount. That goes without saying that we all need to, uh, you know, operate in the highest ethical, you know, the most ethical way possible. Um, but I'm just saying that there are certain other deeper layers beyond ethics, which you need to kind of look at and understand uh, before you start uh, partnering up with people because keep in mind these are going to be long-term partnerships for at least five to seven years maybe 10 years who knows as long as the syndication lasts right and you don't want to be in a situation where you have bad blood between partners so that uh, so that you guys are operating as a well-oiled machine and Lorena I'd, I'd encourage you um, and anyone else who didn't see our previous two sessions I just shared the uh, multi-family multi-family freedom chasers uh, YouTube channel in the um, in the uh, uh, the the chat here. Um, check out our previous two sessions on building your team structure. Uh, we cover how to find general partners and then the structure of how to actually work within a team. Uh, we really cover a lot of what you're you're asking there, Lorena. Yeah, and I can actually give an example too. Uh, I feel like when I started working with this team, I think. Uh, they, well, they actually found me by teaching a class and we, I was teaching a class on underwriting. And then I was able to show them my real estate schedule, go through, through my own uh, CRM system and how my, my investor portal. Um, so they know, I mean, I've worked in this industry for a while. It's just, we all have our strengths within the industry or of your own industry. So it just depends on what kind of strengths that you can bring to the team and how often you communicate. But you can actually see that in our in our last episodes as well. Thanks, Lorena. And Lorena, one last thing that I would add to this is that uh, when you're first meeting somebody um, and you think that you guys want to work together, ask each other for a background check. We've done that in, internally in our team. We've asked each other for background checks. And so we have no qualms um, and I made it very clear to our team that, you know, if an, if, uh, if an in investor wants to do a background check, we have to have a very clean background and we have no qualms sharing that with, with other people. So that's one thing. And that also you'll find in my, in my video series that I've created that I, that I highlight that. And honestly, the best of the best do it. And you don't have to do it for everybody, right? Like if somebody's operating at a very high level, um, you kind of know, but I would I would always say trust but verify. So just make sure that once you start doing it, then you kind of you know understand the the way other the other person works. You've been say partners for years together, then you don't need to go back for every deal do a background check. But at least um, in the beginning, I would encourage that you do that. Um, even if you even if somebody is like coming to you and they're they're you know <laughs> sweet talking you to you, and so just make sure that you're uh, dotting uh, your eyes and crossing your t's. Yeah, that's good to see you. Hi, uh, thank you. I apologize for not having my camera yeah. on earlier. I'm packing for a trip to San Diego for a conference tomorrow. I'm attending that ultimate partnering conference, um, specifically meant for networking partnering. Um, but my, I have two questions. One is, um, if you can elaborate more on a funds of funds. So I'm thinking from what I just heard, it seems like they just invest in other deals and not really purchase and operate a syndication, if you can verify that. And then Andrea, you had a, on your, your presentation, you had a slide that had a, several abbreviations. If you can elaborate on what those abbreviations stand for. And those are my two questions. Thank you. I'll answer the fund of funds uh, question for you, Anna. So fund of funds, you're right. They come on the limited partner side as a fund. 
they create a fund as a special purpose vehicle and then they mm -hmm. op they invest the fund of their investors into any particular deal so yes they are not a part of the gp team and if uh if i remember correctly as for as for the sec uh, requirements a fund of funds i do not think can even be a part of the gp i could be wrong i'm not an attorney so just make sure you you know uh, uh verify this fact but the way they are reimbursed is actually based on the fact that they are bringing in capital to a deal and so they have a favorable split for the larger amount of capital that they're bringing to the deal that's how they earn their split now since they are on the lp side the question obviously is like okay and what happens to the tax uh, tax advantages but the, at the fund level you do get the tax advantages again i do not know how they would um, exactly affect the fund manager's taxes again that would be a question for a cpa um, but that's how how that's how they're structured broadly speaking hey, thank you thanks avishkar i'm actually gonna go into answering oh drew already did it for me thank you drew uh, so the property team slide that I was mentioning before, they have we have what's happening. These people are able to help us investigate the costs and operate the deal. Maybe a question you might have had was the phase one environmental. Or is that the particular yeah. actors you're asking about? So yeah. whenever you're reviewing, a f since I worked in affordable housing and we get financing through FHA or Fannie Mae, the majority of the reports that we look at make they have to comply with certain uh, phase one requirements so usually what, what happens is that those reports in order to see that the apartment that you're going to buy is safe for the tenants then you need to make sure that you're able to order uh, or if it is required to see if you're going to need these types of reports seismic like in california if you're going to buy a property in california you're more than likely guaranteed <laughs> to have to order a seismic report on top of the phase one, which is for earthquakes. Uh, LBP is for lead-based paint. That's usually for buildings that are uh, prior to 1978, as well as asbestos, ACM is asbestos. And it doesn't um, sound like it, but it's asbestos. And then radon, it depends on the zone that your property is located in. Sometimes it's high or low. So if it's high and it tests high, you have to do mitigation. Mold is always tested in these phase one reports and RECs means uh, recognized environmental conditions such as like a uh, underground storage tank. Let's say that your property was found uh, that it, it a dry cleaner existed there before or maybe it had a gasoline station. So that's gonna be a huge, <laughs> a huge issue to your lenders. Uh, but yeah, that's what mostly most of those acronyms mean. And then when you order an appraisal as well, you're going to, you're going to get a couple of values that are included in that appraisal, which would be your land, your as is as rehab, once you renovate it and your insurable values. So hopefully that answered your question. Yeah. And then the line next, the line below the surveyor, Ulta. Yeah. Yeah, so the surveyor, uh, it depends on your lender once again. So if you are able to speak with your lender and they tell you and they realize that the property was built, let's say in 1950, more and you don't have a actual survey within the last like 20 years, they're going to probably have you order an Alta survey, which is like a, a surveyor that's going to come out and do measurements and uh, estimate land acreage um, and base. And also you're going to have to have a zoning report that goes with your, that goes to the lender as well. So I think it depends. Yeah. once again, it depends on the lender. So just make sure you might have to pay for this up front in your, um, in your due diligence, or you're going to have to speak with your lender to see if this is a report that they're ordering on their end. And you're just going to cover the cost through the, the closing settlement statement. Okay, that your explanation was really helpful. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Glad to get help. Thank you. All right, we're going to close out this night. We want to make sure that we respect your time and we don't go over our presentation. But thank you so much, Anna, for your questions. Uh, once again, thank you so much for showing up tonight. The Multifamily Foundation Series. Our next topic will be September 20th at 8.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 5.30 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. That's going to be Multifamily Mindset. That's the start of our new series about money. So how to think about money. Some people like me grew up with immigrant parents and we saw rich people as evil people. But in reality, we realized 
we have to shift our mindset to understand that it can create so much more value and care for the people that we love. As well as uh, our series that shows up on the October 4th is going to be networking opportunities. And we're just going to describe to you in what ways we've seen others as well as ourselves to be able to network, build a team, raise money, and the types of opportunities you can put yourself into. I actually wanted to see if we could do a, let's see. Drew, can you stop sharing screen so we could take a nice little family photo of each other? Absolutely. And I can't wait to see you guys next time. Smile. Thank you guys for showing up. Once again, we have our, I actually feel like I didn't, I wasn't able to share uh, the next Zooms that we have on a daily basis. I feel like I did skip that slide, but we are here every other week, every other Wednesday to describe multifamily foundations. And then Jerry Miles and the, the Miles family are able to come on the Wednesdays that we're not here. Uh, let me see if I could share that. I've got it up. Oh, you got it up? Okay. Guys, if there are any particular topics that you want us to talk about, um, feel free to share it in the Facebook community just so that we are uh, we understand that, you know, where's the need and we can help you uh, with those topics or, uh, or you know, as we talk in the leadership teams, uh, we can discuss and figure out how we can uh, discuss those particular topics if you have any other questions. Yes, and once again, just wanted to re remind you guys that we are the community that's here for you. We want to leave you with high energy and just remind you that we're here for you. I mean, this is a free community. Um, many people spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on education and they really don't feel like they get much, but you have us here for you. Sunday nights, it's a multifamily activation Zoom. So you're gonna get an announcement when those are happening from Trevor, Victor and Marcel. And then on Monday nights, we have broker talks with Ed and Peter. Tuesdays, we're doing napkin underwrite with, it's usually Ed I've seen on there. He does a pretty good job on how to quickly assess if it's a deal or not. And then every other Wednesday, it's us and the Miles family just describing to you a little bit more about what it takes to be in multifamily. Thank, Thank you, guys. guys. Great. Thank you so Thanks, much for showing up. Um, Vishkar, Andrea, um, we've gotten a couple of questions about the underwriting model by Rob Beardsley. Um, do you get, do you happen to have the, the, uh, a link to yeah. can learn more about that? I, I just put it in, I put, put it in. a Lone Star Capital link in, but, um, there yeah, we, we definitely so chose to go with that model because, um, we've seen so many other models out there. Yeah. We, we've course, tested a bunch. I mean, b believe it or not, I've spent money on buying models, um, a, a lot of money on buying different models. And we figured that, too. uh, this is, uh, this is a very robust model. Um, and I think it, it serves the purposes looking at the sensitivities that we need to look at. Um, if you guys check out the, the my course, I'm actually putting our our investment thesis also in there. Um, it gives you an idea of how we look at deals and what are the sensitivities that we're running um, to help our investors, you know, buffer, make sure that we're minimizing their risk as much as possible. Yes, thank you so much, guys. I hope you have a great night, and let's connect very very soon. We'll see you in two weeks. Okay.